May we see it. May we experience it. May our ears be ready to hear from you. In your name we pray. Amen. This past week, I was watching YouTube videos. I know it's kind of risky, a little bit dangerous, but I, I came across this particular video blogger who's an atheist. And what caught my attention wasn't that he was an atheist, but that he was reviewing and giving a rebuttal point by point to one of my favorite authors, Reverend Tim Keller, and his book, Reasons for God. And so I listened in. Now, the person giving the review, he's the little guy there in the, in the box, he, he used to be a Christian, but now he lives by the self-proclaimed motto, doubt is a virtue. And he kind of summarized his argument of why he's an atheist, why he won't go down the Christian you know, road at all, by saying, well, you know, if... If God is real, and he wouldn't give even that premise, he said, if the God of the Bible is really who he says he is, and he has spoken through a burning bush to Moses, if he really did part the waters of the sea and allowed the children of Israel to walk through to safety, if Jesus did all of the miracles described in the New Testament, even raising Lazarus from the dead, then why not do a miracle now? Now, if this God wants us to believe in Him, why not do miracles every day? You know, as I, I listened to that train of thought, I thought, that's, that's a very attractive argument. I, that, that just makes sense. You know, yes, what, if... What more and better a convincing way to really go after a skeptic who doesn't want to believe that God exists, that God is real, that God is good, and that He's with us and for us? What better way that if just every night on the news, whoa, more breaking news. You know, every day there's this camera panning on somebody, and this time it's a, you know, it's a father, and he's got his little kid in his arms. It just tears of joy down his, his face, you know, and he's, he's just from the heart telling the story that, you know, my son has stage four cancer. We're here in the hospital, but last night an angel came to us and said, Jesus heals you. And this morning the doctors checked our son out and he's, he's cured. Imagine, every morning you get out there, the Wichita Eagle, and on the front page there's a section, and it's just the listing of people of those admitted to the Via Christi hospitals or Wesley and, and then a time and a date and then another time and a date and, and the name of the pastor or priest that came and prayed for them and they were immediately healed. And just seeing who's on that list and every day there's more and more. I mean, wouldn't something like that really go after that one relative of yours that's so anti-Christian, so vehemently opposed to God at all, if Jesus would miraculously just appear, and then for that person just walk through the entire scriptures showing point by point how everything points to him, Jesus. Just like he did on that road to Emmaus with those on Easter Sunday who were so distraught. Or if he showed up to everybody who's ever turned their back on Jesus, said they don't believe in him anymore, they don't want him anymore. If he, if he showed up to them and, and very gently restored them and gave them back a position of ministry in place, just like he did Peter, saying, go feed my sheep. Or to everybody who said, I just cannot believe unless I see with my own eyes, unless, unless I put my hands on the resurrected Jesus, I will not believe that he is alive. Imagine if he came to every one of those and he said, reach out your hand. Put your finger here. Stop doubting and believe. You know, what this self-proclaimed atheist desires in a miracle, I don't think it's just atheists. I think there's many of us that would love to have God show up and give us some very personal, convincing, miraculous signs or evidence or just himself. 
You know, just everything that we go through and the, and the deeper of a hole that we're in, even though we're believers, and, and the more desperate and the big decisions that are going to change our life forever, we could just have God show up, give us some sign of sign, then, oh. in fact, we, we want that so much that we kind of look for it. You know, it just in that, in that moment, you know, you're really struggling with, with the decision of, I, I could go to Kansas City for this new job, or I could stay here. Wouldn't it be awesome if just in the night sky, as you're really just gut-wrenched, if God lit up that night sky and placed this brilliant star like he did over Bethlehem, and he led you to your new city, your new home, your new job? You know, or maybe just a dream, an angel. I mean, something where we just knew, yes, yes, this, this is where I need to be because, you know, I, I saw the star over Kansas City, you know, and yes. I, I think that's kind of something we would all like to have, just that convincing proof. And so why we don't get that star, we don't get the dream. You know what we do? We, we look for the signs, for the open doors, for, for things that just kind of work out. You know, like, well, hey, our house sold in two days. You know, the new house, we've got this sweetheart deal on it, and the kids love their new school. Obviously, everything's falling into place. This is God behind it all. Yes, this is where we need to be. My only question for you is, are you sure? You know, maybe, maybe doubt is a virtue. Maybe it can be very helpful for us discerning reality. Maybe all those things were just going to happen anyway, and you assigned this meaning to what God says. Because when you really think about communications, you know, open doors, feelings, circumstances working out, signs, even wonders, even miracles themselves are rather vague ways of communicating. I mean, how, can you really trust it worked out as proof of God's Word? Take even the readings for today, the, the feeding of the 5,000. As it started out, there's even a miracle before that. As Jesus lands, he has compassion on them. And, and he gets off the boat and he begins to heal person after person. Miraculous, right? And then they spend the whole day with him and they're, they're famished. There's nowhere to eat, and so the disciples at least, oh, we need to send these people on, and Jesus, no, we're going to feed them, and, and he does. Two fish and five loaves, and everybody has all they want, and there's 12 baskets left over. Miraculous. But what did it mean? What, what did this sign convey? I'm not discounting how wonderful it would have been to have crippled legs and now to be running and dancing with Jesus and to have been famished and then have a full stomach. That's awesome. But what did it mean? What was God trying to say to me and in my life? And you see, as we really consider what they got out of that, you, you realize, well, nobody turned in that moment and believed, well, Jesus is God's son. He is the judge of humanity and our Savior. Nobody got that message out of that miracle. But that's what we kind of assume happens with miracles. You know, the atheist says, well, if God would just do something big and I'd see it, you know, I'd be on board with him. And you and I are thinking, if God would just give me a big sign. But Jesus went back to the towns where he had done most of his miracles and he scolded them sternly and he said, Woe to you, Capernaum. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. If the miracles I did in you had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they'd still be here today. Do you think you will be raised up to the heavens on Judgment Day? No, you will go down to the depths of Hades. Pretty strong language from our Lord and Savior for those who witnessed most of his miracles. Miracles and signs, open doors and circumstances have their place. But if you really want to communicate with someone, if you want to let them know exactly what you mean, how do you do it? But it's face-to-face. -face, it's person-to-person. -person, it's simple, clear, concise language. You know, in that time with feeding the 5,000, while those who didn't quite understand what the miracle meant, do you know who did understand every word Jesus told them? 
It was those who heard him say, you feed them. <laughs> like, oh, they knew exactly what he meant. It's like, oh. And then there was a dialogue, right? Well, we got a couple fish. We'll bring them here. And now you pass them out. They got it, right? They, they knew this is what Jesus wanted. Nobody was sitting around in a, in a Bible study circle going, well, you know, I feel Jesus, he wants, no, go take this sandwich to that person over there. That's clear, concise. So how, and, and can we, we, you and I, really have that kind of clear communication with God today, right now? Is it even possible? And the answer is yes. If your normal life with God is not based upon this kind of clear, concise, understandable communication, if you're looking for signs and circumstances, if you're waiting for a miracle, you'll never, never find God more than mysterious, His will unfathomable. But if you have a clear, concise word, you'll know exactly. And so that's why... He wants to give us this kind of life with him. So, so how, can you, how can you have that kind of clear communication? Is it, is it in your prayer life? Or is it in the Scripture? Just read the Scriptures and there it all is? Now, I, I know this is kind of scandalous, thin ice, but now that I've got your attention, I'll take a chance and say, no, no. And here's why. We don't believe in God because we believe the Bible. Say it again. We don't believe in God because we believe the Bible. We believe the God because the ultimate source of His reality and the truth is the person of God Himself. It is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who authenticate, who, who gives the, the truth of these words as God says, this is my word. It's not us saying, well, that's God's word. It is God himself. So that when you hear the scriptures, it is a person-to-person -person communication because of the person of God who's speaking it. So that when an atheist or an unbeliever reads the same Bible that you and I do, they, they don't hear the person behind the words because they deny the reality of that person. So how can we know then there's a person behind the words, behind this worship service, behind your prayers? How can we know that? Well, this is where the miracles and the signs are very handy because the person behind the scriptures got himself born of a virgin. There was a star over his house. There were those who predicted his arrival. There were the angels that filled the night sky. The miracles upon miracles that declare not the truth and the reality, but bear witness that the one who is behind it all has come among us. We've seen him. We've talked with him. We've dialogued with him. We've had clear, concise communication with this one, Jesus. But how can we know that what all those miracles meant. It all comes down then to the cross and that Jesus has risen from the dead. And now this one who has risen from the dead remains with us, behind the words, in front of the words, with us, so that as we hear him say, listen to me, listen to me, Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. That this covenant in the blood of Jesus has been given for you, a promise. And the one behind the promise has given himself into death and has risen from the dead so that now when you pray, you're not just praying into space, hoping that, well, a God hears it, but in front of you, in you, with you, is the person of God. So that when you hear the Scriptures, it really is, this is God's Word. Not because I've said it, but because the person. When you come to this table, you're not just eating bread and a little sip of wine. But the person behind it says to you, no, this is my body, this is my blood. In a very clear and concise way, it says, your sins are forgiven. 
I strengthen your faith. So how then do you, do you practice this? It takes a practice. You can't just leave this in your mind thinking, okay, well, God's a person and He's with us. You take it into your prayer life. And the way you do that is that when you pray, you expect a personal presence immediately with you. When you walk through your day and at your work, you expect a personal presence of God with you. And when you pray, when you speak to God, just even in your thoughts, it's conversational and that there is a dialogue so that you wait for an answer. You ask questions when you don't know. And since it is a real person, you can't expect just the answer right away, but even in your own house, you don't get answers to everything you ask because there's a person there you're talking to. And then, when you think you have an answer, you check it with what this person has said before, with the Scriptures that do not change, the Scriptures that are, are good and useful for teaching in righteousness and training in, in all godliness. The scriptures that make you wise unto salvation, the scriptures that give and produce the faith as the Holy Spirit works in and through them. So what, what Jesus gave then in the bread, what Jesus gave to those people miraculously, we receive every day Himself. May the Lord bless you as you put into practice then His presence this dialogue, this conversation. Amen. Having been heard from God, we speak back to Him what we have heard. I invite you to stand.